Oh, hi folks. This is what I look like after being at an airport or on a plane since about two o'clock this afternoon. It is now 10 at night. Um, but yes, uh, it was a lot of finagling to get out of the house. You'd be amazed at how much I have to do just to leave for two days. But I have brought with me Homer, the surrogate pug, who has traveled with me for the past 30 years. He's been to Rome and England, and he's been all over the U.S. Anywhere I go, he goes, so I get a picture of him this year. And I have made it, indeed, to Demicon, where I am a guest and an artist, and I will be speaking on the Supernatural and Valent Tween, uh, as well as uh, Revenants and Zombies tomorrow night. Ha <laughs> But today is also World Paranormal Day, and it has been a day. It's been really exciting for me this year. So the first thing that happened was when I was at TSA, and I was going through the security screening, and you have to understand, I was running real late today. Uh, I mean, I made this plane by 15 minutes, and I never cut things that close, but that's how it worked out. Uh, Tampa Air Airport was insane. But I had this little device, and I had the cat toy in my bag. Uh, I brought two little, you know, things in case I happen to go out and do any poking around uh, and also to kind of do as a show and tell. And, uh, and the EMF meter triggered <laughs> TSA security. So the woman pulled me aside, looked through my bag, pulled out the device, and she's like, what is this? And I'm like, it's an EMF meter. I'm a ghost hunter. I'm doing a talk. Uh, and you have to understand, I was like, and I'm like two minutes late, you know, from missing my plane here. And so she looked over the device and she said, oh, that's so cool. And I ended up, uh, she believes in ghosts. And I gave her a Spirits of St. Petersburg card and my EMF meter got a sticker and we passed and I ran for the plane. But cool. Okay, that's the first time I've ever gotten pulled over for the paranormal stuff because I have traveled with things before. But okay. Um, the second thing that happened, uh, I got here to Iowa uh, after a god-awful flight to Minneapolis, which was the most turbulent I think I've ever taken, and then a puddle jumper from Minneapolis to Des Moines. But I have been trying to research the ghosts here, and nobody talks about their ghosts. They are well hidden. I don't know what they do to them in Iowa, but they ain't around. Um, I keep running across the same ghost stories, and everybody points me to the same cemetery. So I'm like, okay, most of these things are out of the area and I can't get to them because I don't have a car while I'm here. Um, but uh, I was thinking about doing the cemetery this year. Last year, I learned about the cloud room at the airport and I actually did get in there to poke around a little bit um, and nothing really happened, but it was still kind of cool. So this year, things have started off on a much better note because honestly, nobody would tell me their ghost stories last year. This year, uh, the first thing that happened was actually with the shuttle driver who told me about a friend of hers who had an NDE years ago and shortly thereafter moved into a new apartment and in this apartment uh, he complained that things were happening. Nobody would really believe him but she did and she said it's because she was there twice when something happened. The first time she actually watched like the TV cable box antenna thing go like flying off uh, and it was just, she said, in a way that you really could not explain. It's like somebody shoved it. And the second thing was that they were um, sitting in the living room uh, on, on another visit. And all of a sudden he had a Bluetooth speaker in the bedroom that was not connected or anything. And it started producing static. And they said, or uh, she said, they heard a woman's voice. They couldn't understand what she was saying. It was really gibberish. But... Uh, they heard this voice. I was like, oh, cool, okay. And then she pointed me to the front desk clerk because um, there is a mall here, uh, the Merle Hay Mall, which is uh, haunted. And apparently this mall goes back to the 60s or 70s. From what I'm understanding, um, there was at one point a nunnery on the property, then there was the old mall, and there's a new mall. And I guess they kind of built things on top of each other, or there's like interconnected levels. There's something that interconnects. So the desk clerk said, yeah, when he was a young man, he was there. His mother worked at the mall, and uh, he was going through the mall. He went down into the basement where their conference room was because he was waiting for her. And he said when he walked in, he saw all of these nuns, and they were singing. And he was like, what the heck? And he went back out and he found his mom and he's like, why are there nuns singing in the conference room? And they went back and checked. There was no one there. And she said, there's no one in the conference room. It's not even signed out. Well, they did research and it was later on that they discovered that it had been a nunnery at one point. And I guess the building floor print must have somehow overlapped or been connected to 
from what I'm understanding, the old building that housed the mall before the new mall. Take that as you will. So um, then he pointed me out to their security guard whose husband owns the security company she works for. And she said that the men report to her husband that when they're at the mall, they see these shadowy figures kind of gliding through, but if they try to approach them, they vanish. I'm like, cool. And her suggestion was to maybe check the basement. Uh, I guess there's a bowling alley there now, and I may try to walk it with the EMF meter. So that was pretty cool. Uh, then she added a story that she had, uh, actually two stories. One was, I think it's called Redville High School. She went there and for reasons unknown, I guess she and a friend of hers were at the school after it had closed. And um, they were on the school grounds and they witnessed like this very dark shadowy form staring at them. And I said, well, were there any features like, you know, any hat features or like, was this a shadow man? And she said, well, no, it was like he was wearing a ski mask, you know, no features whatsoever, but he moved super fast. Like he was on the first floor and then they looked again, he was up on the third floor and then somehow in the basement and I guess there's basement windows. I, I don't know if Florida doesn't have basements, so I'm not sure how that worked. But um, I guess they even, like the next day, they tried to test the stairwell to see if it was physically possible to move that quickly and they couldn't get it to happen. But she didn't know anything else about the ghost. I thought, okay. Uh, and then she mentioned that when she was six, her grandmother died, but when she was 10, one night she woke up and she saw a full-bodied apparition of her grandmother, like solid looking like she was alive, wearing a particular outfit, certain hairstyle, certain hair color. And she said her grandmother was trying to say something. And for the life of her, she could not make out what was being said. But years later, uh, they were going through a family album and they found a picture of her grandmother with the grandmother's siblings. And the grandmother was wearing that exact outfit. So it was really cool. I, I'm delighted that people are feeling comfortable enough with me right now to tell me their ghost stories. Um, I'll have to think about maybe poking around the mall. Um, and then there is a very old cemetery that's not too far from here. I think it's the oldest in Des Moines. Um, I just, I don't know about doing a lot of stuff by myself in, uh, in the Midwest, but you know, we'll see. So there you go. Cool. Happy World Paranormal Day.